Hello guys, welcome to another episode of the Hop Hop Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about uh, surviving the foundation dentistry uh, year in the UK. Uh, that's the year of uh, postgraduate training you do straight after university. Um, and we're going to be joined by Dr. Zain Rivsi, who's just about to go into FD year, so he's going to be fielding the questions for me. I think he's here. Let's find him. Zane. Just add him in, and hopefully he should be in with us pretty soon. Uh, I have seen him join, so that's... Hi, soon. how's it going? You all right? Hey, man, how's it? How's it going? How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good. Guys, if you can hear any yeah. issues with the audio, let us know, and we'll just adjust things. Sometimes we need to uh, turn down our phones a little bit sometimes and things like that. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations, man. I hear you've uh, completed the BDS course, which is great. Thank you, thank you. It's nice to just get get it get it done. Although a weird end to the year as well, to be fair. We were kind of going full steam ahead in March and then everything kind of just locked off and we sat all of our exams online, got all of the news about passing online and it's kind of been, it's just been a bit different. Um, yeah, not your usual end. Yeah, no, I, I think you're probably the only year in, in history that's going to have a an end of the university just like that so uh you're the one off i think or we hope yeah. anyway um should we dive straight in because i know the guys dropped in so many questions so uh, yeah but i'm already best to go with that and then we'll chat afterwards yeah 100 percent. um so I, we can kick things off um i think a big question that i had and a lot of people in my year have is that obviously we stopped doing any kind of clinical work around march this year and even yeah leading up to that because we had exam <clears throat> finals scheduled around april time we were kind of reducing the kind of clinical work that we were doing yeah. so obviously a lot of us haven't touched the handpiece since around march time and we're gonna go into work in september you know out in the real world so i think the first question was what do you and obviously it's difficult for you to predict but what do you reckon will be the pre procedure or protocol in place to make sure that everyone's kind of up to that benchmark to start on patients yeah, I think that's a, a good question. And I'm actually of the opinion that it's not going to matter that much. Um, normally, you would finish your finals in around uh, probably the same sort of time as, as this year. And yeah. then you have about 10 weeks, eight to 10 weeks off. Mm -hmm. um, and your skills probably would slow down a little bit, you know, in, in that time. Um, but speaking from experience, I failed my finals. Okay. I then had to reset in November. And had to wait so i passed in november and i waited till september to start doing any work so i hadn't touched a drill in 10 months okay and really within about a week you know the most difficult part was getting my head back in into doing um assessing a patient making my treatment plan that was the hardest part for me picking up the drill was really not that much uh, kind of different to if i'd done it like everybody else because i i didn't feel like i was any further behind Mm. Uh, so I think hand skills aren't something that's going to go away. It's a bit like riding a bike. Once you kind of uh, have learnt it for the first time and you've you learnt it properly for the first time, you would hope. Yeah, uh, you should pick it up pretty quickly once you go back in. Cool. Uh, we've got we've actually got a comment from um, Ryan saying that in his year they actually had a couple of days in a phantom head clinic to get up to speed. And I have heard stuff like that for the I think the London dental schools anyway. They're looking to maybe do like a pre foundation um, program. Really cool. Just clinical get, skills by day get, yeah. get working um so that could potentially i think help ease some worries about it but as i understand it your first couple of weeks like what's the general timetable right they kind of ease you in don't they it depends on your F, uh, fd training practice some people like to have you shadow so you can get your eye back in on you know doing a treatment plan and doing that kind of thing um the practice i was in they just dropped eight patients on me on the first day <laughs> i think they were of the opinion that you've passed finals you know what you're supposed to be doing. Mm. You need to get patients under your belt as quickly as possible. And yeah. there were big gaps after each patient. So the FD kind of uh, your uh, ES would come in afterwards and say, what have you seen? Um, what was the BP? What was this? What was that? And then do the treatment plan with you. And really it's, it's very similar to all the mock finals we did with deciduous. It's the same sort of thing. Mm. Only then you're going to do the treatment as well. Um, I, I think that's probably a really nice way to do things because uh, I think it's probably down to your personality as well. Some people like to see things again. 
Yeah. You have to watch someone else. Yeah. I was more of the, I want to do things because I get bored watching other people. So uh, for sure, I think that's a, a good way of doing it. So um, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a little, kind of it's a little similar to dental school where like you get different tutors who have different teaching styles. So some people like to hold your hand throughout the whole thing and then others mm. leave you to it and you kind of develop through just repet repetition and experience. So it's probably quite similar to that where there's no one method of kind of, you know, easing someone into it. Everyone kind of responds to different, different types of uh, teaching. Yeah, you, you know what they say about the 10,000 hours before you master something. Um, <laughs> I suppose if you, if you waste that first two weeks watching, uh, yeah. you've got a, you know, a couple hundred more hours to, to make up a bit later on. So yeah. you might as well get stuck in early doors. Yeah. Um, and not diving on treatment, just diving on treatment planning, because you can bring someone back for a retreatment planning session if you want. Um, mm. But it's probably, probably nice to get your brain working that way. Uh, yeah. I think it works quite nicely. So that's kind of how I would prefer to do things. And I was lucky that my practice kind of went that way as well, because honestly, I get super, super bored watching other people do things that I think yeah. I should be able to do. Mm. Uh, different with implants and you know and uh max back surgery you know yeah uh, I, I don't know what i'm doing there so yeah cool that'd be nice to watch but um yeah. something like an exam i think you just want to do it yourself yeah i think i think a big concern for me initially is when when we're doing examinations obviously that some patients are quite easy to treatment plan and some just have so much going on you're kind of thinking damn do i have to come up with a treatment plan in, in a couple of minutes of seeing this patient or is mm. it something that maybe you know i can tell them initially like what their acute issues are if, if they're in pain for example and, and kind of start to engage with that but i think like as a long-term treatment plan i know that it would take me quite a long time to kind of figure out everything that i wanted to do and how to do it but you're saying that you know you can always discuss that after the appointment and get back to the patient bring them back in and and talk these things through with them right yeah well if if someone comes in and you know it's all bp ones and zeros mm. and you know there's no fillings that need to be done you've taken x-rays and that kind of thing mm. then it's not an issue if you're going to bring someone back and you've seen an obvious bit of caries on the next for anyway you mm. just go okay we'll bring you back for the for the, for that filling um and then you can run through other bits and pieces that you're unsure of with your es afterwards and then yeah. you know when they come in for the filling you go uh, yeah i was just re reviewing your x-rays and uh, actually i saw something that i didn't see in the couple of seconds i had to look at it last time just mm. just kind of don't blow smoke up them but you know yeah. they, you, you had a second look after they finished when you're doing your notes uh, and you think X, Y, Z also needs to be done. So yeah. you don't need to be like, oh yeah, uh, the guy next door was like, yeah, you, you're crap. Um, and, and you didn't see this, you didn't see that. Just say, you know, we had a look afterwards and we think that this is the way to do it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and, and also like, I'm seeing some of the comments and like, I think those den young dentists who are watching who have been through FD definitely like share your experiences in the comments because it's quite helpful to have like a, a variety of, of kind of experiences because clearly it differs from practice to practice and from supervisor to supervisor. Um, yeah, for sure. What would you say uh, that kind of your most stressful or difficult part of DFT was? Like, what for you? Like, what was what was the hardest part for you? Um, I was someone who kind of wanted to try things. So sometimes mm. I would say, "Oh, I can save that," when maybe I couldn't. But it's it's one of those things. So it kind of because I didn't have enough experience to look at a tooth and go, actually, that's the way to do subgingival. I was thinking, well, I know some people could say that. I wonder if I can. Do you know, like, so it's one of those yeah. things where I was like, oh, well, you know, I te I, technically I, I know people can say that, so I want to try doing that. Um, so it's kind of working out where your level is and what you can actually do. Uh, that was the most difficult bit for me. So in terms of treatment planning, um, do you know, things like, oh, I, I think I could do some X, Y, Z. And it's things that I'd read about and, you know, seen online so that is where the the bad side of the online stuff comes in or well, i say bad i say um it's more take it with a pinch of salt like the guys who are doing that kind of work are really really talented and really skillful and probably have yeah. equipment that you don't have um so sometimes that was probably the difficult bit for me on on that note actually when these kind of things do inevitably come back to you and you know you're obviously going to make mistakes in this first year um yeah. how much kind of support there or reassurance is there or are you kind of left on your own to kind of deal with the consequences of your actions if that makes sense is it quite like a hard lesson to take or yeah i think it's one of those you you're it's down to how you and your es will work together if you're someone who's going to say look um if i've got any kind of problem i'm going to get you in and you've got mm -hmm. like a good 
line of communication between the two of you, it can be quite, it can be quite okay. Cause you know, you can say, I think I made a mistake here. Can you come have a look, see if it's rectifiable or do we have to do something here? Um, yeah. And they know that you're going to make mistakes because, you know, uh, I think one of the questions or comments that was popping up quite a lot was the, the worry from a lot of people of lack of experience in university. So uh, mm. not having done enough of X, Y, Z and yeah. being worried that when you're left on your own, you're going to screw it up. Um, mm. Which, you know, unfortunately, the way things are, um, it would be nice to do way, way more. Um, but for sure, I, th I think it's down to kind of making sure that you're proactive in terms of getting the support because the guy next door has got 30 patients to see, you know, yeah. unless, he, yeah. unless he's, you know, private or something. Uh, and yeah. he's just got an FD for the, for the fun of having an FD, which some of them mm -hmm. do. Um, mm. But if he's doing his own list of 30, 40 patients a day, which my ESs were, you need to tell them in advance that something's coming in that you're a little bit unsure with so they can make time for yeah. it. Yeah. I think that's that's really good, a good lesson because I think a lot of us in dental school are just in the habit of just kind of carrying on as we are and then we get to a problem and we're like, oh, damn, what do we do now? And then at that point, you know, mm -hmm. if your ES is busy, they might not be able to come in and help you at that point. So it's all about kind of thinking ahead and planning ahead for something that might be tricky. Yeah, I mean, they should come out if you have an issue because sometimes issues do arise. They should just come across yeah. and drop what they're doing uh, okay. as long as they're not in the middle of a, uh, of a, you know, they finish the patient off and then come and come and help you out. Um, yeah. that's that's kind of their job that's what they get paid to do uh ryan's yeah. got a comment down there i used to like getting all the radiographs sorted first appointment series of interoral photos this way you can plan mm -hmm. complex cases and potentially a tutorial yeah. yeah yeah that was something i was going to come on to photography is the most important thing that you're going to do in fd um mm. not because you might go ahead and post it on instagram like me or like some other guys but because mm. you can finish the day's work you can then stick yeah. it on a big screen, you know, yeah. sorry, a yeah. big screen, and you can yeah. see all the small details and go, actually, that was really good. The, that side of that filling, I didn't quite do as well. I should have removed some more carries or that, that was maybe a little mm. unsupported or, you know, whatever it might be, mm. you'll, you'll learn much, much more yeah. doing one case slowly and photo photographing it than you do mm. doing 10 cases quickly. Yeah. I think, I think a massive complaint that actually a lot of students have, especially I know at my dental school, is that we don't get exposed to clinical photography on, uh, on clinics enough. Um, but even then, like, I think you find ways where if you speak to people like yourselves or other young dentists that you interact with, even on social media, a lot of them can kind of give you the basics. And then it's all about just putting that into practice, isn't it? Like just taking mm -hmm. lots of and learning from your mistakes and, and just slowly developing that skill. It's, you don't need to know exactly how to take a complete set of photographs for you oh, it doesn't need to be a perfect yeah. series photograph. It just yeah. needs to show you this is the prep that I did. And mm. so you can look at it later. Mm. Uh, it needs to show you this is the, the, the box that you cut, you know, or uh, the access, whatever it might be that you're doing. Mm. That then later on, you can go and have a look and say, actually, you know, you might, you might throw it up in a little private group with a couple of your friends. And, yeah. You know, that you, can, you can kind of just go, yeah, you did all right then, mate. Yeah, well done. Or, or you can, you know, roast each other depending on what your friendship's like so um that's kind of how how we did things so uh that can work really nicely i'm working yeah. on a couple of bits that might be helpful for guys so um kind of check yeah. back for that later and yeah. so um i think that's probably the biggest thing is the photography I, I think that's where i definitely step mm. things up the fastest and the quickest because i was photographing just about everything i did i remember yeah just thing on photography, um, slightly controversial question, but what do deans make of you posting uh, your work on like social media or Instagram, for example? Because I know you're obviously enrolled uh, in the foundation uh, training scheme, so you're kind of under their jurisdiction. Whereas I know when you're... Yeah, I, yeah, I think the deaneries are are mixed. Some some don't mind. Some are out, you know. Some some are less less for it. Uh, I think, and I don't want to get in trouble here, but a lot mm. of them are a little bit backwards in that, in that sense. Uh, because from what I can see, if you're mm. somebody who's photographing your work, your work is likely to improve at a much faster rate than someone who isn't. Yeah. Because you're going to take that photo. And if you're going to stick something online, you're going to get rinsed if there's anything wrong with it. So you're more likely mm. to do better work than people who aren't doing yeah. it. So I'm, I'm fully for it as long as yeah. you're doing the consent form. Patient knows what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 
yeah. I don't think the degree needs to get involved, and I'm pretty exactly. pretty against them getting involved in that kind of thing. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. I think there's a, there's definitely a culture. Um, I think mainly amongst Oceans where they they kind of view Instagram, social media as kind of like you know it's a waste of time there. You're not really going to learn anything, but actually you do learn a lot and as long as you kind of look up anything that you think you've learned with you know back it up with evidence and everything and review mm -hmm. it um there's no reason why you can't learn so much from even just sending your work to other clinicians and asking for their feedback on it um yeah so i think yeah again ryan's contributed uh so it's fine for him and foundation training but got him in trouble during dct so i think it's probably best to ask whoever you're you know working on yeah and... yeah I, th I think that's that's part of it i mean Put it put, from my point of view. If if you've got the balls to post your work, then amazing. Uh, if mm -hmm. you if you haven't got the kind of um, confidence to do that, that's fine as well. But I yeah. don't think they should be against people doing that because it's between you and the patient. It's nothing to do with them. Yeah, as long as everything's consented. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, fine. So let's move on to slightly. I think outside of the clinical setting. So, sure. What. I know this differs based on scheme, but what were your kind of typical working hours, your typical timetable? What was your annual leave like? Those kinds of things that people obviously do think about as well. Annual leave was um, set. So I think you had, was it 20? I can't remember the exact exact number of days. It's like eight weeks or something, six or eight weeks. Okay. Um, I think you'll have to check that because I, I've completely forgotten. Um, yeah. And it's completely down to your practice. Some people are way, way more flexible and they'd let you take extra because they just weren't bothered if, as long as you were doing okay. Some wow. were checking people's hours down to the minute um, okay. and really, really kind of uh, on top of it in that way. And I think that's, again, like it's working life. You, it's much nicer if you're somewhere that's flexible, uh, yeah. but it's down to the practice. And usually the practice manager, usually mm. the principals just don't don't care. Uh, and yeah. it's usually the practice manager who's got a, a lot of stick up about it and um, it's one of those things I know some people had issues getting time off when they were trying yeah. to get time off because of you know nursing rotors which isn't our uh, you know sort of thing but yeah. um, things do come into it um, in terms of how the days are scheduled again it's down to the, a lot of these things are down to the practice so okay. I was five days a week but I was 8.30 till 4.30 Mm. not too bad other people were doing longer days but had fridays off which uh, okay. probably is more preferable i would i would say three day weekends every every yeah. week um, yeah. but yeah although you could probably negotiate that although fridays apparently study, there's like study days incorporated into that monday to friday timetable aren't there so friday generally you shouldn't necessarily be working if you've got a study day on that day uh yeah so if you've got a study day obviously you go into the study day but sometimes mm. the practice will say if you haven't got a study day you don't need to come in Right. Uh, and but the the, the trade-off was you might be working uh, nine till six you know a, yeah. a longer day a couple of hours longer um, okay. but that that's kind of probably negotiable I, I would say if you if you're if you're really fussed about having certain kind of working hours and stuff they'll they you can mm. try and kind of work around that yeah and as, as far as I understand it you know your contract should only mean that you're working monday to friday you shouldn't really be working weekends should you that's as far as i understand i'm not sure i think you're you're contracted hours so i'm mm, not okay. sure that i think there were some practices i know there's a practice in leeds i think it was that was doing a saturday morning but they had less in the week okay uh, fine so just to so, read that over. yeah so you, you'd have to check with the practice it, it, these are all very kind of individual kind of to the practice sort of uh um thing so you, you would find that out once you once you get allocated your place is that still there yeah Guys, I think we're struggling with the connection to Zane. Uh, are you back, Zane? Let me try and let me try and add you back in. I th I can hear you, but you're not moving very fast. <laughs> Let's have a look.
Right, guys, let us know if this is it Zane. Yeah, I think it was Zane's uh, connection that was the issue there. Uh, if you've got any questions while we'll try and get Zane back, uh, just pop them in down below. Hopefully we can we can get him back in so he can finish off the line of questions. He had absolutely loads for us. Uh, let's see if we can get him, get him back across. This is the issue with doing things over the internet, I think. Sometimes uh, we don't have the best uh, connection. Let's have a look if we have any questions further back. No, I think we we covered most of them. There was a there was a, com a couple of comments from Ryan which were added to the discussion, which was lovely. Um, I think Zane is struggling pretty heavily here. Let's try and add him back in. Guys, if you've got any questions, anything that you want to know about Foundation Year, uh, please drop them on in. Oh, thoughts on corporates versus independent practice. Um, I was an independent. Um, I don't like the corporate right. structure. Hey, we got a question from Ryan asking about corporates versus independents. Um, I don't personally like the corporate structure. Um, I think... There is some positives. Mm -hmm. They've got a better buying power and they can get discounts and courses from you because of the number of people who are employed by them. Um, it's, it's one of those. If you can find a good corporate practice uh, with a good practice manager, then you can do quite well. Uh, but equally, there are bad. I think there's good and bad in both, really. So you've got to do your research on the exact job you're going into. Uh, but I think that's probably more for after foundation, yeah, because you don't have much of a choice beforehand. Uh, what are your thoughts, Ryan? Are you back, Zane? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I don't know if you can hear me. I, I live in like the middle of nowhere, so. Uh, okay, no problem. Uh, your 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 sounds a lot behind your um, your video. Beck has got a question here as well for us. Did you find it difficult having an increased number of patients a day? Uh, the increase was pretty gradual. So by the time you got a little bit faster, you were already adding patients in. So it didn't become much of an issue for me because um, you were able to manage it. So once you got faster, um, you would slowly incorporate that speed into your, your day and your book. And you were in control, in control of the book pretty nicely. Um, so... I didn't. I didn't feel that huge pressure. I would. I don't think I ever stayed late. Um, maybe once or twice in the whole year. So uh, I was pretty pretty okay there. Um, I think planning ahead. You know, thinking about what you're doing before you do it. You know, you can see your day list. Have a little look at that so you can think how you're going to manage the patient loads is the best way to do it. And the same thing when you're a, uh, an associate. Uh, if you're looking at your day list early doors then it's much easier to manage. Uh, the issue comes is when they drop in emergencies here and there and into like five or 10 minutes gaps mm -hmm. and it's half an hour procedure. That's where you become a little bit more push for time. And sometimes you can just say, no, that's not long enough. Uh, I'll have a look at the patient and plan to bring them back another time. Uh, so don't, don't overstretch yourself. It's not worth it. Um, Zane, what was your next question? I think Gus is a good question. Uh, so uh, what Akash has asked, which is, um, did you buy any materials during your FD year besides loops and a camera? Was it quite easy to get persuade your practice to buy them? Or do you have to, again, is it individual based? I bought my own camera secondhand. I bought the the body secondhand. I bought the uh, lens, brand new, and a flash. Um, that was invaluable because there was two FDs in my practice. So you didn't want to be swapping the cameras around. Um, and plus, I wanted to take photos of everything. So I would say... Camera is a must. I didn't buy loops. Um, everyone uh, who knows me and kind of follows my Instagram knows that I'm going to do uh, Endo hopefully in, in the future. So I actually waited and I I, um, I went and we've got a scope afterwards instead. Um, so that's kind of what I did. So I, I didn't I didn't actually buy any loops. The ES uh, is supposed to be pretty flexible, but don't ask for crazy stuff because uh, they probably won't get it. Uh, the, I was asking for things every day and I got one in 10 mm. probably. 
<laughs> of the things I was asking for. But uh, if you don't ask, you don't get. So kind of chance your arm <laughs> a little bit because you you do want to try things out in the FD year because you've got that safety net. So it's a good time to try things. Um, yeah. yeah. These are not. Like I've heard. Right. I've heard other. Things. Yeah. I said I was, I ha I've heard things where like you need to, sometimes if you ask for something, they, your ES is kind of like, okay, show me that there's like a demand for you to use that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, you ask for things for cases that might not even come along very often. I think it's like a, it's a balancing act in terms of, you know, can you prove to them that you actually need this thing? Or can you actually, you know, use your initiative a little bit and maybe find ways around something that might have been available to you at dental school? Yeah, um, I think... The things that I was wanting were things like rubber dam clamps, heavy dam. You absolutely need heavy dam. It's the most important thing you'll, you'll use. It tears much less frequently than a medium or a light uh, and also helps retract the tissue below the gingival margin. So that was really useful for me. I thought that was kind of one of the things. I was putting rubber dam on for literally everything I could get my hands on because you want to be fast. And when you have an hour for a patient to do a composite or something like that you can spend 15 minutes putting the dam on by the end of fd i could get a dam on uh within two or three minutes quadrant isolation and that's what you want to get to that level and a kind of speed of uh because you don't want to be faffing around when you come to you know associate life doing half an hour for a, for a dam um so i would say that's kind of one thing that you, you definitely want to be doing is just sticking things on straight away use dam for everything you can uh and then go for it Ryan's got another quote, uh, comment, got to do multiple Emacs golds, chrome dentures, anterior alignment ortho. Uh, it's unlikely you'll be able to do any anterior ortho unless you've got a FES who's willing to kind of have you sit in on their treatment. But I, I don't really know whether that's going to be possible. Um, but yeah, do loads, loads of things that you can get, get your hands on. Can people hear Zane? I can't hear Zane. Any more questions in the comments while we're getting Zane's uh, audio back? Um, what's the scope of doing private treatments like? Would you recommend FD to do private work? Um, so the way you ended up, what I ended up doing was I didn't make much of a distinction between private and NHS. If I wanted to do something, um, I um, that was that was probably what I I was happiest doing, because I could just go in and say, look, you can have a composite, you can have an amalgam. Uh, composite takes a few minutes, an amalgam takes you know half an hour, um, or which you know a composite. Sorry, composite takes an hour or so if you're going to do it properly. Uh, and a, an amalgam might take you 10, 15 minutes. You could probably do a quadrant in about 20 minutes once you get faster. Um, so I would try and do anything and then do it on the NHS. So the patient isn't paying out of pocket because you're you know, still learning, um, but you've got the opportunity to do extra treatment that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. FDs aren't contracted to do any, tr any actual UDAs. You've got like a unofficial target of 1800. Uh, but it doesn't really come up unless you're especially slow. Um, you're, you, the, the practice does not get paid target. for your UDAs for next year, what kind of a target you want to be doing. Uh, but you're not getting paid to do the UDAs. You're getting paid to, to learn, basically, and, and become a better dentist. Zane, are we back? Yeah, yeah, we're good, we're good. Um, I've got a question about uh, career, progression of career, because... Obviously, the way that people mostly go after FD training is that they go into DCT or they carry on as associates. Now, do you guys get any kind of advice, any instruction, any recommendations on that kind of stuff? Or, or is it kind of all left to you to kind of figure out yourself? Um, I think you need to understand what you like to do uh mm. and then pursue that. So it's going to be different for everyone. There are a few study days which are useful you know they have different people come and speak to you uh, but i think mm. the best thing to do is kind of try a bit of everything and see what you enjoy and then you yeah. know maybe maybe go and watch 
someone who's really good at pros uh, do their work and maybe, maybe kind of at that point, it's a good idea to see a little bit more specialist work um, because you yeah. might want to do that. Um, but in terms of career progression, I think it's good to get your FD year out of the way. DCT, um, I would recommend for people who maybe struggle with extractions and oral surgery or want to get some surgical experience. Um, I think I'm not well placed to talk much about DCT because yeah. I thought it was a waste of time personally for myself. Um, I saw it that it was only going to be the sort of thing mm. that you would do if you wanted to do the hospital route of specialization, which I had no interest in doing because I didn't want right. to go into that whole pathway because it's very long, very slow. Um, and there's a lot of politics within hospitals, which I just could not, you know, I couldn't care less about. And it's one of those things that I, di I didn't want to, to go into. Um, so there are probably better people to ask about yes. DCT than I am. Um, but I think if you're wanting to progress your career, take a very small UDA contract the next year. Take the hit on the money. Don't don't try and earn loads and loads of money because the faster you work, the worse your work gets and the harder it is to break that cycle because you get used mm -hmm. to having more money. And then mm -hmm. if you then say, actually, I need to get better, that process of getting better inevitably will mean that you get less less pay to start with. Uh, and then that's yeah. difficult if you're used to having xyz you know and going to xyz restaurants and going and doing all these other things so i think that's the one thing that i would say is take a small contract or even just really bite the bullet and do something really brave and go straight to a private job do your standard dentistry don't be doing a line bleach bond but go into mm -hmm. a job where you can spend an hour on your checkup you can spend half an hour on your recall yeah. you can yeah. spend a bit longer doing everything you might earn as much to start with but your skills are going to get much better mm. because you're taking time to do things properly. Yeah, That's how I see things. And I think that's that's a very difficult step to take. Uh, but I think the people that do that do really well. Yeah, I think I think there's a variety of perspectives on it. I know people who have... I think it also depends a lot on the DCP post that you applied for from what I'm hearing. Some are very mm. like bureaucracy and admin heavy. Some are very hands-on. Um, I think the onus is obviously on us to do our research about these things and make sure that we, we kind of apply for something that's going to benefit us. So um, another good question by Akash, what do you reckon about doing courses during FD? Do you think the study days and putting them, the lessons from that into practice or do you think, you know, private courses? Did you do any? I've been on one course uh, and that was this February. Um, and it was a composite course and I thought it was a complete waste of time, actually. Um, I didn't learn anything new. Their big tip was pre-wedge. Uh, so I paid 400, 400 pounds for a day of, and their big tip that I didn't know already was pre-wedge. Uh, and I kind of already knew that anyway. So um, that was probably a complete yeah. waste of time for me. I think if you're going to go on courses, you really, really need to um, do your research. I think my brothers came to say hi. <laughs> Here he is. Anyway, Zane. All right. How's the podcast going? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, not bad. It's good. Yeah. Uh, Mine's so, yeah. not holding up. <laughs> yeah. yeah so my internet can see as you want. You're for the Wi Fi. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least I'm on 4G. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, Zane and my brother were in uni together in uh, Imperial in London, so that's, that's why he's come to have his say <laughs> um i've completely forgotten what i was saying uh dc dct i think yeah there, there is a there is a place for them uh but it's not for everyone just about sure. courses oh courses uh yeah so that course that i went on was a composite course it was in um it was in chicago went to the when, when i went to midwinter meeting um which was incredible by the way guys if you if you want to go to a like a conference chicago is great the other one that's going to be really good is dubai and i'm hoping to go there next year um but that particular course was the one that i paid you know a fair chap chunk for and they didn't teach you anything that you mm. don't already know nothing that i wasn't already taught within university it was just something that you need mm. to put to practice and go ahead and do it there was no kind of yeah. oh wow that's a special technique um 
to be honest, if you want to learn composite court, any composite, just go into Shiraz Khan's uh, YouTube. He's put a couple of videos up and that was essentially in 10 minutes, you'll learn what I learned in a whole, uh, whole morning of uh, composite course in that day. So that was probably a, a better way use of your time. Uh, yeah. Than going to some of these courses. There are good courses out there. Don't get me wrong. Monic Vizant's course is incredible, but it's a year long thing. Uh, I would wait till you've finished your FD for sure. Uh, for that kind of a thing, because it's a it's quite expensive, but he is very very good teacher, yeah. and he will be teach something better. And that's that's the person I know who's done that course is in in the course in the process of finishing it off now. So um, yeah, I think mm. there is there is some benefits of courses, but not not just any. Don't don't just dive in and do loads. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah. I think some some good good advice I got was um, the lessons straight away. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that's for sure. There's no point you going on an implant course to how to do implants when you're an FD. We're not going to be placing, so that's that's completely kind of useless for you. So yeah, be be clever when you do it. You can go to free study evenings. There's some good study evenings out there, um, which are either cheaper or or free. And you can learn a lot. You can, you know, socialize, network and things like that and, and kind of pick up some good tips from clinicians that way. So you don't always have to go on these big, big courses. For, that's that's for sure. Um, got another question. How many patients did I see in FD year? And are there a certain number of procedures you have to do? Um, you have to log everything you do. Uh, there's no minimum or maximum as far as I can remember. I think you had to log kind of completed treatments and they would see where you stand within the, the cohort obviously if you're doing no cobalt chromes and no endos or something like that then that's a worry because you need to be showing that you're proficient before you can go into independence practice um so there's no minimum uh by the end of fd i was seeing 20 to 25 patients a day and we started off with you know much much fewer than them a uh, good question there any other questions from the stickers that we got? What's the process of applying, applying for jobs after FD? Is it difficult or long? Um, do you get offered by your FD practice? Um, I think it depends. So a lot of FD practices do like to keep their FD on because they're under the, t under the table. It's not easy to get. Um, and a, a good associate they know what you're like uh so it's not uncommon that your fd practice would offer you the job um and if you're happy to stay in that area then sometimes that's a really good thing to do because you can see the treatment that you've been doing in fd come back and you can learn from that uh so that is a good good thing to do um other than that you'd be asking around you know maybe there's practices which suit you a bit further, a bit better that maybe some of your friends were at or, you know, your practice owner might know some people, you know, in different places where uh, you might actually want to live. So if you had to move out to Wales, for example, and you're a Londoner, you're probably going to want to go back to, to London if you've got family, friends and, you know, so your social life's there. So sometimes you do have to look further afield. Um, but there's usually a list of practices who are looking for uh, looking for a new associate that goes around and gets passed around by your TPD. Uh, that certainly happened with uh, my with my kind of uh, group, and we we had a few kind of job offers go around like that. Um, so it's not particularly difficult. I don't know how COVID is going to change all this. It could be a completely different kind of ball game by then. So um, I think we'll have to wait and see on that that side. But I don't think there's anyone who didn't manage to get a job afterwards. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, you can start the search early. Um, I would say. March is the earliest you need to start looking because you've got all the way till September. Uh, but if you're wanting to get into practice in a certain place, then start looking early so uh, people know that you're looking for a job and you can kind of make those connections. Yeah, yeah, I've just answered that question as well, Mimi. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Zane, can we hear you or not? <laughs> I know we can't hear him. <laughs> He needs to go and live somewhere, somewhere with good wife.
but look personal opinion a year in max max with on call is very beneficial do you know what we might just have to get ryan on instead because uh no one else is uh zane's not doing very well today uh let me try and get zane back once more any further questions guys let's have a little look my my internet my internet's literally lasting like 10 minutes at a time yeah you're, you're struggling here drop your yeah. question in quickly what else have we got for me quick guys <laughs> anything less from the questions on the stories we put put up um no we've got pretty much got everything to be honest i i think a lot of them revolved around kind of pressure to do with time and seeing an amount of patience but i think You've, we've kind of revisited that quite a lot. Mm. Um, we've covered like study days. We've covered uh, kind of getting equipment. Um, you know, you, you specified on kind of loops and a camera and how vital they are. Um, Namita has got some uh, questions about salary expectations in a, and uh, associate roles. Yeah, so your salary is really going to be down to where you're going to work. If you're going in London, you're supposedly the the uda rate is like nine or ten pounds which is not particularly nice i know if you go into places like hull or you know further afield you could be looking at 14 uh so for the same job you could be looking at 40 percent more um there or thereabouts the number of udas is going to be very important how many you're going to agree to do i wouldn't take more than five and a half thousand or agree to more than five and a half thousand because you're going to want to take time off it took me six to eight weeks to get my feet under the table and actually kind of crank out the UDAs on a consistent basis. That means you've only really got six months worth um, of UDAs to be getting for the foot, you know, from September to March. Uh, and that first month and a half, maybe even two months and a bit is very, very slow. It takes a while for you to finish off plans, it takes a while for you to finish off dentures, uh, crown and bridge work, endos and things like that. So, uh, that can be a bit slower, so I wouldn't take a big a big yeah. uh, contract if if I were if I were doing it again. Um, and like I said, I'm I'm much more of a fan if you've got the opportunity to try and do maybe a much smaller contract, maybe three days and a couple of days in a in a private job, maybe just to get your feet under the table and kind of uh, have a bit more time to spend. Trouble with that is, are you going to get the patience in a private job? That's the difficulty. Uh, and the worry that you're not going to get those patients. Mm. Um, it is very much swings and roundabouts. I think the actual salary, you could be anywhere from 40 grand up to 80, maybe even more. I think if you're living further south, the uptake on private treatment is much, much better. Uh, so you'd be getting a little bit more from that. Even if you're in a NHS job, you can be picking off bits of private treatment alongside the UDAs that you're doing. Uh, so you can be getting a few thousand a month if you're, if you're doing really, really well there with that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and obviously if you start offering further treatment, like Invisalign, um, Align Beach Bond, you can start to get much, much more um, kind of revenue through the doors. The one caveat to that is some of that treatment is highly, highly technique sensitive. And as we were talking before, we don't already come through university, and this is me as well, with not the best amount of experience. So should you be offering that kind of treatment early doors is probably not is what I would say. How can you get into private dentistry after doing foundation year? So this is another reason why taking photographs of your work is really, really important. If you could come out of FD uh, with a portfolio of 60, 70 cases that you've done, whether it's a simple composite, simple dentures, uh, cobalt chromes, but you can show that you've done these things to a high level and a high standard, that's all that's required to get into a private job. And private dentistry is not this kind of impossibly high standard to get to. It's just the, uh, it's almost slow dentistry. That's what I would call it. I would say it's dentistry that you would normally do in the NHS, but you take time over it. You get to know the patient, you understand what they want, and you have more time to do the treatment that you want to do on them, which inevitably leads to a better standard and better quality of treatment. And anybody can do that with the training that we've received in university. The difficult part of private dentistry is implants, full mouth rehabs, uh, all that kind of 
cosmetic side of Dead Street, that's much more difficult. Uh, Zane's asking what kind of he's he's here as a ghost. He's just texting me now. <laughs> Uh, what kind of advice would I give in order to deal with the admin side of things of D, uh, during DFT? I think the most important thing you need to do is get into a good habit with your notes. Uh, have some have some good templates ready, and make sure you change these templates every time you know you drop it in. But make it personalised to that patient. So you've got a framework ready. So whether you're doing a checkup, it would be social history, dental history. Uh, medical all checked and you can say what the smoking was and drinking and all those kinds of things afterwards you can then put you know uh, complaints you know all the things that you had to do for finals just put it into a template in words copy it across when you have a checkup and then populate that kind of uh, what you find and then that gives you a nice framework to work from where you can say this is the stabilization phase this is the uh, uh, rehabilitation phase and then this is the uh, you know the long term probably the best way to do it uh zane's going to give it one last try with his internet and and then give it a day if not let's see any other questions guys uh but yeah that's probably the way i would i would deal with the admin side and make sure you finish your notes kind of before the next patient is in uh i know it's not the best thing but uh it can send you kind of behind schedule, but if you've seen two or three patients, if you're not finished the notes, you don't want to get confused between which patient had the occlusal carriers on the six and which had the occlusal carriers on the five, because that would just get really messed up. And next time they come in, God forbid you, you jump in on the wrong tooth because you didn't finish your notes and mix two teeth up and two different patients. So finish your notes before the patient is, is, has kind of the next one's come in. Uh, just it's in general I, I was reading a study a while back in the meter in general the further south you go the more private uptake of treatment there is i think that's just to do with socioeconomics yeah um, you're back for 10 minutes i'll literally be here 10 minutes and then the sound's in a cut and then my picture freezes and then i'll uh i'll i'll, I'll jump out uh, uh any other questions you've got for me in terms of uh fd yeah uh, I think the main thing as well is to make sure you, you get a range of opinions because everyone's experience is obviously quite subject. It's like all, all that we know is the practice that we did IFD in. So obviously everyone's had slightly different, different experiences and what one person has necessarily be the same for you. So I think it's, it's obviously important to keep asking around, especially within your schemes, because we've, we've just been emailed out our schemes. So I'm already yeah. contacting kind of, you know, last year's FDs just to find out a little bit about the area study days and the scheme. So I think for the ones going in, to FD, I think I'd really recommend that first. Get in touch with the ones who have done it in your scheme the, the past year. Um, I know deciduous mm. are obviously also in that regard. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's fair. It's going to be difficult because ideally you would meet each of the trainers and then you would pick the two of you who, who, who mesh up best. That's probably the best way to do it. I know that they've done away with that in most places and now it's just kind of based on rankings. Um, so it's, it's going to be difficult. You're just going to have to rank off what you hear about people and kind of work out who might be a good fit for you. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think just get opinions from people who've been through the whole system. If you've got friends who've done things, um, then that's, that's a good, good way to find out. Uh, Ryan's asking about reciproc versus continuous. Um, it swings and roundabouts, mate. I, I use a continuous at the moment. I've got pro taper gold. Um, there's a different tactile sensation with each. That's, that's the difficulty. And, uh, you need to, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those, it, it depends what works in your hands. There's, neither is better than the other, but there are, there are pluses and minuses for both. So, um, it's what, whatever you're used to probably the best thing to go with and, and like get good at one thing before, you know, you switch between things because if you switch between things too much, whether it's bonding systems, you're going to get confused. You're going to forget what you're doing and why you're doing, especially at a young age when we're still learning. Uh, or if you are going to switch between things, have a very set method of, okay, this is a reciprocating one. This is a continuous. This is, this is my pathway for that one. This is my 
pathway for that. Same with your bonds. Make sure you know what bond you're using and what etch you're using, selective etch, total etch, all this thing, because it makes a big difference to the longevity of your restorations. And I don't think a lot of people even look at the, the bond that you're using. They're just going, oh, yes, bond. In terms of getting an associate position, is it something you recommend starting to look for early in DFT year? Um, second half of the year, kind of past February, March, I would start looking. Um, but you can leave it longer if you're looking to get somewhere which isn't so high uh, in, in high demand. To get into MaxFax, is DFT necessary? Uh, yes, if you're trying to do a DCT in MaxFax, you do need to do DFT. What if you don't get along with your ES? Uh, that's difficult. I think you've just got to stick it out. Uh, just keep your head down, do the work, and then uh, uh, have a better time once you've finished. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of part of working life to work with people that you maybe don't like. Uh, just keep it professional. You don't have to go out for meals and drinks and you know coffees with these people. You just need to do your work and, and finish. Any comments, Zane? Have we still got you? Uh, I think we're just going to lose Zane, I think. Uh, just keep on dropping your questions. We've got about nine minutes left, guys. Uh, Dental Dan Nicker is asking, how hard was it to take state study Take the study days off. You need to be there for the study days. Look ahead. Make sure that you uh, plan your holidays around things. If you do have the situation where you are, you know, you've got a family wedding or something like that, you should know already, you know, most things are scheduled, you, you know, year in advance, six months in advance in terms of that sort of thing. So there can be a little bit of leeway, um, but it's down to your individual scheme and how tough they are with you. Sometimes there's four, four days of the study day going. So you might just be able to switch, switch, it, switch into one of those. Um, but that that's something that you you can't be missing study days so you have to be uh um you have to be pretty on top of the ball with that one max fax pathway yep zane's answered that one for you you need to do fd you will probably need some sort of a dct job you have to do medicine and dentistry so if you want to do full-blown max fax um so yeah that's correct there nada from friends who have done these do yeah, so Zane's answered the question there. Uh, let's see if we can... Ryan, I'm going to add you in and hope your internet's better than uh, than Zane's was. And we'll hopefully just finish off the last five minutes and have a impromptu guest. Any other questions, guys? Uh, if you don't get on this, how to get to Max Fax DFT? Yeah, we've done that one. Hey, Cammy, how you doing? If you haven't seen the the camera tutorial with Cameron, uh, definitely check back on that. That was really, really good. Uh, we went through a load of things. <laughs> Zane's tapped out. How to be a dentist? You need to go to dental school. You need to. Uh, it depends where you are. If you're in the States, you need to do four years of post, uh, four years postgrad training. So you need an undergrad. If you're in the UK, you can go directly into it after school. Uh, I'm for it in terms of building a social media presence in dentistry. Uh, I think it's one of those things that is very much uh, down to your individual. If you're going to just do it for uh, kind of marketing reasons, and it's a very, very different way of doing things. Hi, Ryan. How are you doing? Hey man, you're right. You've got good internet. Wow. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, the delights of living up north, I suppose. I don't know how yeah. you met. <laughs> yeah, up north we're a lot more tech tech uh, tech savvy, I think. Uh, Namita is asking about social media presence in dentistry. I think it's a good thing. Um, you do have to be careful. Don't be, you know, posting photographs of people who haven't consented for that kind of a photograph. But it educates patients. It can educate yourself. You can create a good network. You know, I, I don't see any uh, bad sides of it, really, once once it's done correctly. Yeah, I think you've got to be tense about it, haven't you? Yeah. Have you got any questions about FD year or um, have you finished yours? So I, I'm uh, I'm just about to start medical school for Max Sachs. Um, okay, perfect. 
So I, I did FD two years ago in Bristol, and then I did DCT one and DCT. I'm just finishing off my DCT two now. Yeah. Okay. So you you do need both then. So that was one of the questions we had. I didn't really know fully the answer. Uh, so you do need to kind of do that to get into med school. Do you think? Yeah. I mean, you have to. It, it depends whether you're dental first or medical first. I mean, presuming everyone watching this is dental first. So yeah, you have to, you have to do your FD because in order to do DCT, DCT, you have to have done your FD. So you do that. Generally speaking, you'll have to do DCT1 and DCT2 because if you want to get onto any of the shortened courses, which ideally you do, those are the three-year courses. Yeah. Uh, you have to have done two years of max facts. So those are places like Liverpool, Birmingham, Bart, um, Manchester, Glasgow, and Birmingham. Those are the, the mm. three you kind of want to get onto. Yeah. So I, I think it's just showing that you're, you're actually serious about doing it. Uh, and then obviously they go, okay, he's not just, you know, oh, I'll do medicine now because I don't like doing normal dentistry. They actually, you do want to do the max fact side of things. You need that experience to show that it's your, uh, it's your kind of calling. Um, any tips that you have, obviously you've done FD as well, you know, same as I have, any things that kind of stick out for you that maybe me and Zane didn't cover? I think you've covered a lot of, uh, of great stuff there, but I think just being so aware of the fact that it's your year to use the time that you have, you know, that you've not got that financial pressure on top of you, you've not got that time pressure, the treadmill mm -hmm. of the NHS, you know. And I, I was very fortunate where I worked that my lab bill was, was pretty much un, unlimited. I could kind of do what I wanted. Not everyone will have that ability, but I yeah. think, you know, just, just believing in yourself a little bit and having and, and taking on cases to, that you might not necessarily have thought you can do, particularly if you've got an FD, a trainer who's, who has an interest in something. But even if, even if you don't, you know, I think you can often do a lot more than you think you can if you, if you're using the correct principles and you're consenting properly. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's key. You know, uh, take the best of the year you've got uh, and make sure that, you know, if you're going into a certain practice and you have a list that guys are going to rank off, um, maybe have a look at which practice offers implants. If you're interested in implantology, who's doing facial aesthetics, if you're interested in that, because you could kind of jump in and have a little look um, yeah. to make the best of the year. Obviously you've got some people who are going to jump in and have a little look and see what you're doing. So you can try things like gold on maze, like you, like you said, uh, yeah. Try Emacs because the bonding protocol is not easy and it's key to an Emacs uh, success. Uh, yeah. So for sure, I think that's one of the things, just kind of use that support net while you still got it because it's not going to be there for very long. Another thing I did uh, was on the weekends, I would I would kind of try and make connections with local specialists. You know, they usually have kind of Saturday morning clinics and stuff. So I, I would try and, you know, maybe once a month or so go and either shadow like a specialist periodontist or I, I was in Bristol. So I went to, with Contemporary Endodontics a couple of times. It was, they're you know, a great bunch of guys who are really supportive. And I think, you know, it's just because you get quite a narrow view of dentistry in FD a lot of the time. <laughs> You're seeing NHS practice and, you know, I think, a lot of people on here are asking about specialising and that sort of thing. I think if you can go and see what it's like in a proper specialist practice, and you can see that you know there are two very different worlds of dentistry out there, and I think that's important. Yeah, I, I think the hospital versus practice versus specialist practice versus corporate versus you know uh, private, they're completely different ways of doing dentistry, and it's, it's quite nice to have a little bit of an idea of that before you dive in one way. Uh, biggest thing that I learned would probably be that i'm only interested in endo <laughs> i think that's just about it really uh, yeah for me. i think finding what you like is great but i mean even if you do something and you hate it at least you've learned something right i mean i know people yeah. who've done two jobs in you know max facts or peds or whatever and they say well i hate i didn't really enjoy the job it wasn't like what i thought it would be but you know number one you're gonna have learned, you're gonna have learned stuff by doing it uh, either way and number two at least now you know you don't want to be a pediatric dentist or whatever you know. Yeah, I think the MaxFax pathway is something we definitely want to cover. Uh, maybe yeah. we can catch up again on that sometimes. We've got about 50 seconds left, but thanks yeah. for yeah, subbing in for Zane for the last 10 minutes, mate. Yeah, uh, we'll do MaxFax at some point. I'm more than happy to talk about it. Yeah, let's uh, send me a message and we'll, we'll sort that out for you guys. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Zane, for attempting to use your internet. Um, <laughs> If you've been enjoying the things that I'm doing, I'm now popping all these podcasts on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to support what I'm doing, and hopefully help me take it full time or professionally with nicer backdrops and sound and audio quality, have a little look at my Patreon group. There's some interesting benefits for you guys there. And make sure you turn on live notifications and follow the two guys that we had on today. Uh, 
thank you guys for for joining bye bye